We'd like to look now at the book of Acts and the way in which the doctrine of creation is essential in the argument of the apostles in the preaching of the gospel. Psalm 146 is the psalm, I think, which is quoted three times in the Acts. It's verse 6 of Psalm 146. You may want to turn there. The psalm is praising Yahweh. It's looking forward to the deliverance of his servants. And it's looking forward to the kingdom. Verse 10 of the psalm says, Yahweh shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Alleluia. And in that purpose of God, which uh, is there expressed in terms of God's love and kindness to those who are bowed down, the hope of the gospel, is this fundamental statement in verse 5 and 6. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Yahweh his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. And in the same psalm is a warning in verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. I just mentioned at this stage the uh, issue of Darwin's doubt. You see, verse 3, I think, is a very, very important warning for us. Because if the Bible's true, then the best of men is fatally flawed. But we know that, don't we? Because when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, the world is going to be judged for their rejection of God and his message. It's not a surprise that we're up against a great majority of those who don't believe. That's not going to sway us to join them. But if evolution is true, you still can't put your trust in princes. That's Darwin's doubt. You see, he, he said, well, the thought that the human mind has evolved from lesser creatures, what confidence can I have in the thinking of that mind? You know, put it way, where does rationality come from? Why does any evolutionist think that their theory should be taken seriously by anybody? Because it is but the product of chemistry and physics, which is supposed to have some survival value, or it will die out. The claim to truth, the claim to have been able to discover something which is real, and not just the chemical processes, uh, which are out of anyone's control, they're just the way things are, made Darwin um, lose sleep. So if you wanted to look up this, you can Google Darwin's doubt, and you can, you can get that. But it's, it's a, an interesting point. Put not your trust in princes. When we come to uh, Acts chapter 4, we'll see there very briefly how the, the apostles... When they praise God with one accord, lift up their voice. Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said. Now notice that point was made to me earlier, that the Lord's use of Genesis 1 and 2 is proving that it was God's word. Right? that God had said from the beginning. Whatever scribe wrote down chapter 1 and chapter 2, this is God's word. And it's the same thing here. It's linking creation in verse 25 with David speaking by the mouth of, uh, sorry, God speaking by the mouth of his servant David. Now that's what scripture describes as the way in which inspiration works. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 15, we have the second use of this psalm. And Paul and Barnabas are up against it. Uh, they've been mistakenly identified as Mercury and Jupiter. And they want to tell the people that they are just ordinary mortals. And that really these gods are fake imaginations. 
This is the truth. Verse 50. Sirs, why do we these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that he should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Well, that's interesting because there in verse 17 is the beginnings of an argument for the existence of God from nature. That there is evidence in the cycle of harvest and the conditions which support life that God is giving witness to himself. You see how the Apostle Paul takes that forward in Romans chapter 1. When we come to chapter 17, this is developed even further. Because the Apostle is on Mao and Mars Hill, he's speaking to the princes of this world. And let's not underestimate how clever these, these guys were that the Apostle Paul was debating with. The Epicureans and the Stoics, you know, they were, they were pretty sophisticated intellectuals. Uh, they weren't dumb. They were serious uh, brains. And the Apostle Paul is having to debate with the best brains in the then known world who were schooled in the philosophy of the Greek, famous Greek philosophers. And some of them became uh, disciples of Epicurus and others of Zeno. And the school of Epicureans and Stoics were there now to debate with the Apostle Paul. And what does he say to them? You know, he doesn't apologize for creation. He doesn't minimise it. This is his, uh, virtually his first statement. So this, this is uh, what he says. That the unknown God is creator and Lord. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he need anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations for to dwell on the, all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. But what's he saying? Humankind was created from one. Verse 26. It's pointed out the word blood isn't part of the New Testament text. I'll accept that. He hath made of one. And the theistic evolutionist says yes, but that doesn't mean one person, it could be one group. Oh. It's interesting, you see, the Aborigines of Australia are said to go back 40,000 years way before Adam and therefore are not children of Adam. <clears throat> as far as I can see that, it's a pretty racist comment to make. But that's where theistic evolution leads you. The Apostle is saying that all are made of one. Now what's he talking about? What one do you think the Apostle might have in mind? Is there any serious doubt who this one is? Is there any hint that it was a group of people? And God has controlled the nations which descended from this one and has controlled their distribution on the face of the earth in a way which means that they can seek him. Now that's interesting in itself. That God has so organized the nations. It's a reference back, as the margin might tell you, to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 tells us how God used Israel as a witness through the centuries to his plan and purpose with the nations. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So who is the one that the Apostle Paul is speaking about? Well, he separated the sons of Adam. When, when the nations were divided, it was according to the number of the children. I don't think that just means, oh, there's, there were 70 nations in Genesis 10 and there were 70 children, you know, and that's a nice coincidence. Isn't he saying that providentially God was controlling the nations, that, that Israel would be a light amongst them. It, it's so strategically placed between three continents. 
that, that word, even in the days of um, Solomon, the Queen of Sheba could come up, you know, over a thousand miles and more. Because she'd heard of the wisdom of Solomon. So word did spread, even in those days. And the Apostle Paul is saying now that God had so organized the nations that they might seek after him. And he is the one who is sustaining life. The fact he quotes one of their poets is interesting and something that sometimes is used as an argument uh, by theistic evolutionists, but we can, we can look at that again. What um, it goes on to say, right, is that the creation, the creator testifies to his existence through that creation. Right? Mankind is supposed to understand there is a creator outside of the creation because it couldn't be part of the creation so you can't make the image of the creator like the thing created because by definition he is outside of what he created and his intervention in the resurrection of the Lord see if we can't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead instantly then where are we going to go and if we can't believe that, then we, uh, oh, sorry, if we can believe that, what's the problem with Adam being created? If God is going to create out of the dust of the earth, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes instantly, thousands, if not millions, of brethren and sisters from all ages, instantly, where's our problem with the Creator doing something similar for one man in the beginning? But one uh, theistic evolutionist has said this. So when Paul says, of one he made all nations, this is not a reference to Adam, since Genesis was unknown to the audience. In other words, Paul could only say something to his audience that they already knew. But wasn't he teaching them? Wasn't he bringing new knowledge to bear? Wasn't he instructing them? Out of ignorance. That interpretation needs to be abandoned right now. We need to interpret it in the Hellenistic worldview of the Greek audience who did not think that humanity descended exclusively from one person. But Paul is using scripture. He's <laughs> quoting, yes, he's quoted a Greek poet where it has a point of contact, but he's quoting Isaiah 46. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32. He's using the truth because he's trying to preach the gospel to these people. There's no reason to say that Paul wasn't um, referring to Adam there because they didn't understand that Adam was the first man. Goes on to say, this writer goes on to say that, that they wouldn't have been familiar with Genesis. Well, it says there, Genesis, I don't think Genesis would have been unknown to Greek philosophers. What sort of people were they? I mean, 10% of the world's population at the time was Jewish, so I've read. Do you think the Greek philosophers in Athens didn't know about the Jewish scriptures? Do you think that the incorrigible inquisition of these men had overlooked that? For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. So the idea that they were ignorant of Jewish teaching of origins and therefore Paul couldn't possibly refer to the one from whom all mankind derived seems to me to be based on nothing at all and it is helpful to think to realize that Paul was talking to evolutionists right? he was talking to evolutionists so I put that before you now if, uh, for you to think about and to research a bit further <laughs> Epicurus and Zeno, the two schools that were being uh, followed. Epicurus, Wikipedia, fount of all knowledge. But Epicurus, <laughs> the purpose of philosophy was to attain the happy, tranquil life, characterized by peace and freedom from fear, the absence of pain, and by living a self-sufficient life surrounded by friends. He taught that pleasure and pain are the measures of what is good and evil. Death is the end of both body and soul, should therefore not be feared. The gods neither reward nor punish humans. The universe is infinite and eternal. The events in the world are ultimately based on the motion interactions of atoms moving in empty space. 
right? And he taught that more complex forms came about by the movement of atoms of simpler forms. That's where we came from. Now that philosophy is very similar to what's been promoted by humanists today. There's probably no God. Epicurus was, was indifferent to the gods. If they were there, they were in the background, they weren't interfering, all things are carrying on as they were. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. That is an Epicurean philosophy. Now I'm not making this up, others have pointed this out. Epicurus uh, is credited with using the problem of evil to argue against the existence of God. This is the problem, the modern problem. Right? This is why people don't believe in God. Overwhelmingly, this is the reason, the problem of suffering and the problem of evil. Epicurus was an exponent of that argument. And uh, I once went to, you can, you, can, you can follow it up. Basically, if God is uh, all powerful, why doesn't he stop evil? If he's all good, he'd want to. Uh, either he's all powerful and he's not all good, or he's all good and he's not all powerful. He can't be both. Right? And that's you know, a philosopher's question which has been debated for centuries. So these weren't um, uh, rough and ready debaters using crude arguments. These were sophisticates using the latest thinking that Paul was up against. What does he say to them? Let me say, God that made the world. That's what I'm talking about. Now, this uh, series of slides comes from a writer called Anthony Long, who is uh, at a research center in uh, University of California, Berkeley, one of the top ten best universities in the world, has been for, for many, many years. And he is writing on uh, the intelligent design debate that is such a political issue in North America. And he says that much that divides the two sides in the modern United States was already a major source of debate in classical antiquity. So he's not writing as a, you know, uh, a, a religious person, he's writing as a philosopher of history of science, right? So he's saying that what's going on in intelligence design was going on earlier in classical antiquity, pitting theistic and ideological Platonists and Stoics against anti teleological Epicurean atomists. That's what Paul was in, uh, engaged with. Right? And by saying God that made the world, he was identifying with the Stoics not the Epicureans. He was, as it were, dividing his audience and saying, I believe in God the created. And the Stoics say, yeah, well, so do we, so do we, so do we. And the Epicureans are going, no, 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 that's not the way it is. The Epicureans, even today, are the unsung heroes of ancient science. And there's six points he makes. The starting point for understanding the world is rigorous empiricism. That's how you understand things, by observation and testing observation. We have reason to think that everything we experience is ultimately explicable by reference to physical facts and causes. They were um, philosophical naturalists. They believed everything could be explained by physical causes. The building blocks of the world are uncreated and everlasting atomic particles incessantly in motion. And it was from that motion that complex organisms developed. Science has no use for inherent purposeness of mind in matter. There's no sense of direction of travel in all of this. There's no purpose. Just be happy. Apparent evidence for design in nature for example, the complexity of organisms and organs. They were debating that in Paul's time. Apparent evidence is due not to an invisible guiding hand, but the determinate ways that matter organizes itself according to strict causal laws. And life and mind are not basic to the world, but emergent properties of particular types of atomic conglomerates. They're absolutely up-to-date evolutionists. The Apostle Paul was looking them in the eye. 
He made no point of contact with them at all. If the Apostle Paul had known, or the Lord had known, that evolution was true, might not the Apostle Paul have said something to allude to some similarity of thought with them? But he did not. It wasn't that they were ignorant of the concepts in those days. But this Berkeley University professor, the Epicureans even today are the unsung heroes of ancient science. Basically saying they had it right. And of course by implication Paul was wrong. Now that's interesting, don't you think? It, it raises Paul's debate above the level of, well, he didn't know, bless him, he was, you know, in those dark days, they, they were uneducated men, and God made allowances and, you know, just, just humoured the, them along, you know. It wasn't like that at all. Well, let's go to Romans chapter 1, because here we have the apostle developing this. The apostle Paul, chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ, given full measure of the Holy Spirit and speaking the word of God to us. And he warns us that the judgments of God are ready to be revealed. The wrath of God is ready to be revealed from heaven. And from verse 18 to verse 32 we have I, I think another of these inverted parallelisms which is uh, very interesting and which centres on verse 25 which is the verse that ends our men. So this is quite a key verse. And what does it say? What is the history of humankind in falling away from God? I think this is what chapter 1 is about. Um, I don't think it's just about the Roman world is steeped in sin. It's about those who knew God and have turned away from him. It's, it's a summary of the history of mankind. And it catches some of the things of Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the things of the flood, some of the things of the apostasy of Israel are, are worked into this uh, cataclysm of evil. So God is going to hold the world accountable to him. That's what Acts chapter 17 says. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. There will be evidence contemporary with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ which will mean that the world is responsible to God at that time the time of darkness will have passed men will have been brought to reject him and his message and what is the center what characterizes human thinking from from the time of uh, the earliest times who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And what does evolution do? It places the power of creation in the creature. That's what the Epicureans believed. That complex life forms came about through properties inherent within the conglomerates that made up life and take away the need for an external cause that say that everything that exists is naturalistic. There is nothing else. There's nothing transcendent. There's nothing beyond. There's nothing that is out there that we cannot measure. What the Apostle goes on to say in verses 19 to 20 is very, very important, I believe. He says, that, well, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So they are without excuse. That's the way it goes. We are without excuse because God has shown it to us. Well, what has been shown to us? The invisible things. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, even his eternal power and Godhead. God is expecting us to understand from the things that are made that there are invisible things. Now he's not saying there's a book of nature which should stand alongside the scriptures and held in equal regard to teach us about God. He's not saying that. 
He's saying there are invisible things which we must infer exist from that which has been created. Because that which has been created tells us there must be a creator who can't be part of his creation. Now a lot is made about this book of nature. But the interpretation of the book of nature changes with the times. So what reliance could you put on the book of nature as read by scientists today? And anyway, which scientists? Which school of thought? And when you get what's called a paradigm shift, what will you do then? Because a paradigm shift means everybody was wrong until this one guy came up with a new idea. And now everybody believes it and they're all right again. There was a time when tectonic plates weren't known about. So everybody believed things went along in a certain way. And then comes along a man who says, no, there are tectonic plates and they're moving. And everybody was wrong before that. And now everybody accepts it. And they accept it happens slowly. But what happens if it had happened fast? The model, so I'm told, this is not my area at all, but I'm told by my brother, that the person who modelled tectonic plate movements for the American government ran his model with a different, slightly different assumption and showed that the tectonic plates could move that whole distance in a fraction of the time. Well, if that's the case, who can say it's unscientific to think that, that in his days, you know, the earth was divided, that huge forces could not create um, structures and features in geology, that the uniformitarian hypothesis can't explain. It's called a paradigm shift. When everybody's wrong, they say, oh, all right, we'll all change. So what book of nature are you going to read then? If you'd read the book of nature in the time of William Paley, you'd look at a, a clover and you'd read the trinity into it, because it's got three leaves. There's the trinity. That's what the book of nature was supposed to have taught. But what the apostle's saying is the book of nature is teaching us about invisible things. Let's link that up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. These are the invisible things that Romans once talked about. This is not the book of nature. It is the faith that with that which you can see originated from that which you cannot see, which is the word of God. Now that is an argument, don't you think? That's what the Apostle Paul, he was the agent that the Lord chose to go and tell the Epicureans their error. So what about the princes of this world? And sometimes it's said, oh, well, yes, okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, the warning against uh, trusting in the princes of this world is referring, obviously, to people who are pretty backward and they got it wrong. But look, modern science is different. Modern science has got it right. Modern science could put a man on the moon. Yes, I, I'm not one of the conspiracy theorists who thinks that man didn't go to the moon. Right? I don't believe the earth is flat. <laughs> you know, we don't deny that which has been found. It's the interpretation of what's observed, which is the bone of contention. And look at this. Just carry that thought of the Apostle Paul and the invisible things. Now look, this is uh, the National Academy of Sciences, as I say, in the United States, where... Uh, teaching uh, evolution and creation in schools is a hot political topic. A lot of attention has been given by the establishment, the scientific establishment, to find arguments against creationism. So that's why I go, if you want to get if, like, the best arguments against creationism, 
you know, go to the US academies because they're, they're the ones that have had to you know, gird up their loins and really have a go at these creationists. Um, right? So that's why I quote them. Look what they say. Creation science, because there are creationists who argue that you can follow a scientific approach. You could do research or that. And, you know, nobody in this country would get a grant to research creation, would they? Nobody would get a grant to research a catastrophe happening to the human genome. And if you hypothesize, look, I think some of these genetic changes are due to uh, not uh, adding of things over time, but actually something happened very suddenly uh, to the genome. No, nobody would give you a grant. In fact, you'd be howled out uh, with ridicule. In fact, you wouldn't even get a job. You'd never get into the rat race in the first place if they had the inkling that that was the case. You have to conform to the paradigm of the day to be what is called a proper scientist. Now, if you work in chemistry and physics, it doesn't matter too much. In biology, I can imagine it would be very difficult. Because science, by definition, excludes God. Creation science fails to display the most basic characteristic of science, reliance upon naturalistic explanations. Instead, proponents of creation science hold that the creation of the universe, the earth, living things, and man was accomplished through supernatural means, inaccessible to human understanding, by definition, not science. Now, one can live with that. In other words, if you're a scientist, you can live with the fact, I'm not looking for miracles here, I'm looking for mechanisms, I'm looking for how the DNA is translated into proteins and so on that produce these structures and functions. Yeah, no problem. That's called... Um, uh, scientific naturalism, yeah. philosophical naturalism, is when you go from that to say, and therefore creation's wrong, because it's not scientific. That the only thing that exists is that which can be studied. That's what the Epicureans believed, and that's philosophical naturalism. It is an assumption, it is an article of faith of evolutionists. Because if, there, if you concede there might be a God, then it might be different from what you can see. And God says in Romans 1 through the Apostle Paul, that the things created are there to tell us about transcendent things. Philip Johnson was the founder of intelligent design movement in the United States. And if you're interested to look into the detail of some of those arguments, of course, in, in religious terms, we, we can't agree with a lot of what they say. But in terms of their scientific critique, it's often very interesting. It's called the Discovery Institute. It's in, uh, I think it's Portland, Oregon, but they've got a website and there's a lot of material that you can look at. Um, and by the way, if young people, you are having doubts and questions about that, then research it, right? Don't just go, you know, going around, oh, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Bottom it out. Chase it down. Investigate it. Get the facts. Find out the assumptions. Yeah, do the work. Don't just be lazy and think, oh, I don't know about this. Right? Read. Look, there's a ton of material here. Until you've gone through it, don't come to me and say, oh, I don't know where... X and Y came from. Find out what people have been suggesting. Philip Johnson, professor of law he was in Berkeley University. I don't think Berkeley uh, is sympathetic to creationists. It's, it's a left-wing American radical university. Philosophical naturalism is so deeply ingrained in the thinking of many educated people today, including theologians, that they find it difficult to imagine any other way of looking at things. Right? That's, you need, we need to wise up on this. This is the philosophical basis for the attack on creationism. It's, a, it's contrary to Romans chapter 1. Hugh, uh, Scottish, uh, topical, Scottish philosopher. Um, part of the, you know, the, the heritage of Scotland, which is made a, a big deal of nowadays. He was the one who is still quoted today to argue that miracles don't happen. And, and his argument is something like, I've never seen one, nobody's ever really seen one, therefore they can't occur. 
John Lennox, who was a Presbyterian uh, creationist, uh, writes some excellent books to answer some of these attacks on the Bible. Although we can't agree with him in everything he says, he's certainly well worth reading and a brilliant debater and has debated with these high-powered evolutionists and I've looked at many of them and I think he's won them all. Well, I would say that. But he certainly hasn't been silenced by them or embarrassed in any way. And he's debated with them in the Oxford Union and other places. And this is what he points out. In order to know that experience against miracles is absolutely uniform. In order to know that miracles don't occur, you would need to have total access to every event in the universe at all times and places, which is self-evidently impossible. Therefore, Hume cannot know that miracles have never occurred. He is simply assuming what he wants to prove, that nature is uniform and no miracles have taken place. Right? There is clever scientists still make assumptions based on their philosophy. No one's challenging their cleverness at their science. It's their philosophical pedigree which may be called in question. And Stephen Hawking had a film, you know, uh, uh, an Oscar was awarded to the actor who played him, wasn't it? In, uh, um, and he wrote a book recently called The Grand Design. And in this he said, he said this, rated to be, you know, one of the cleverest men who's ever lived. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. The universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now that's what we've been asked to believe. All right? We've been asked to believe everything came from nothing and nobody did it. And the world has swallowed this. <coughs> they say scientists have proved that that's the case. And this is what um, John Lennox uh, pointed out. By the way, John Lennox is a professor of mathematics at Oxford University. And this is what he said. Physical laws on their own cannot create anything. They are merely a mathematical description of what normally happens under certain given conditions. Newton's law of gravity does not create gravity. It does not even explain gravity, as Newton himself realized. In fact, the laws of physics are, only capable of are not only incapable of creating anything, they can't even cause anything to happen. So he has debunked this statement. Right? Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe will create itself from nothing. And what he says is, so what's nothing? Is gravity nothing? You see the flaw? Because there is something. Call it gravity. So where did gravity come from? There isn't nothing if there's gravity. So the statement is self-refuting. And that's the cleverest man in the world, alive today, in many people's reckoning. It's his philosophy, nobody's doubting his maths. And he said, it is hard to see how free will can operate if our behaviour is determined by physical law. So it seems we are no more than biological machines and that free will is just an illusion. So that philosophy leads you just to, well, I am what I am. I can't do anything about it. If I think there is something I can do about it, that thought has been put there by something I can't do anything about. So it's all pointless. The fact that he's clever enough to come up with a theory is just an accident of some chemical, physical mm -hmm. event in the past that has led to him coming up with this thought. Why would we think it's true? Well, let me take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 because the wise of this world, verse 8, the princes of this world, didn't know God's purpose. And why? Because you can't know it. Because God's purpose, God is, these are the invisible things which we can only know by revelation. They are by definition outside of human experiment. So at the centre of 1 Corinthians 2, which has the same pattern, verse 9, 
As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the thing which God hath prepared for them that love him. We can't work it out from basics. It's not up to the mind of man to discover the purpose of God in nature and work it out. Only through revelation can this be the case. It doesn't matter in what age the princes of this world are. Now look, you can see there that there are a number of references in Isaiah, in 1 Corinthians 40, to Isaiah, chapter 40. A number of verbal links with Isaiah 40. And this is important because Isaiah 40 is telling us that the princes of this world, which are confounded, are confounded in a context which is about God as creator. So, Isaiah 40, verse 12, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in balances? Who has done that? It's the creator of heaven and earth who has done that. Verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching his understanding. That's the setting for 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The princes of this world, when the apostle Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, he is still in mind of the Epicureans that he was debating with then. And they are pretty sophisticated evolutionists. And what he says to the Romans is that it's the invisible things you've got to realise. That's the argument of scripture for the existence of God. And because it's true and because it's beyond us, we have to depend upon his revelation, which is where our faith comes from. Our faith doesn't come from looking down the microscope or looking through the telescope. Our faith comes from the word of God. As God's inspired revelation to us. And so what, does, what do the created things tell us? That when, when scientists are asked, well, you know, how come life is just right? You get the answer. There's no broad agreement among physicists and cosmologists that the universe is in several respects fine-tuned for life. From galaxies and stars down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. You get the point, right? That this universe appears even to the rational, cold scientist irreligious scientist to be just right for us to be here and that is an argument that's difficult to deal with for them but when you look the other way you go you know from the stars down to the telescope you find that Charles Darwin is called into question because he realized that if it could be demonstrated that there was complexity 
beyond your ability to see how it could have come about by small gradual stages, then his whole theory would collapse. And Michael Behe, who wrote the book Darwin's Black Box, makes the point that in Darwin's day, the cell was thought of as a bag of liquid. <laughs> and now it is extraordinary. So I'll show you, you're familiar with the molecular motor, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, extraordinary thing. The simplest life form, the bacteria, has an outboard motor on it to drive it uh, through the environment. An outboard motor so extraordinary in its uh, engineering parts that it can't be replicated in terms of efficiency today. For the longest time I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. In the 19th century, when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines, literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in my view. Many of Behe's doubts were tied to a remarkable biological motor. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That's designed. You know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. Well, that, that's astonishing, isn't it? Of course, now this is a target for creation, uh, for evolutionists to attack. And you will read, this is the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, in their book that intelligent design fails because science has explained away the um, irreducible complexity of those features. And they'll say things like, the claim of intelligent design creationists are disproven by the findings of modern biology. Biologists have examined each of the molecular systems claimed to be the products of design and have shown how they could have arisen through natural processes. Now, I think that is very, very misleading. 
what they have shown, well, they haven't shown anything. They have said how they can imagine how the parts of that motor might have been borrowed from other motors in the cell. So it's like seeing a car, you know, being produced, and you say, well, I think that came from the production line in Longbridge, is it still there, whatever, right? And you say, no, no, it didn't, no, it didn't. Uh, uh, the, the mechanic got a, a wheel from over there, he got a hood from over there, he got a bit of an engine from over there, and that's how it came together. It wasn't designed at all. Well, that, I don't think, is a very good argument. So if, you, if you've read and, and you've dismissed intelligent design out of hand because you've been told that modern biology has now shown how, how that isn't the case, well, watch Michael B. He debated with evolutionists recently on this subject and see if you still agree that scientists have explained it because I think this is one of the misleading uh, statements that they make. I think myself that intelligent design uh, as an argument is still exquisite. And my last example uh, is another scriptural example like the peacock's feather. Uh, uh, go to the ant because this, tell me how this evolved. Uh, tell me this. This is the leaf cutter. I like this one because I saw a line of leaves walking along the floor of a forest when I went to Guyana for the first time. Uh, chopped up leaves just wiggling their way through the forest and, and uh, the brother of it says, oh look there's some ants, I couldn't see an ant, all I could see was these leaves wiggling through the forest and underneath was an ant, you know, carrying it aloft and they have a, a, a nest which goes for you know, 20 metres underground and 20 metres in area and, uh, well you know what they do, do They emerge regularly to forage blazing trails that extend hundreds of feet into the forest. Most tropical plants are permeated with toxic chemicals, a deterrent against browsers. The ants cut fresh vegetation, but they don't eat it. They feed it to another organism. Foragers carry their cargo down into the nest and turn it over to smaller worker ants. They clean the leaf fragments and chew them into a pulpy mulch. Leaf cutters cultivate a fungus that breaks down the toxins in the leaves and swells with proteins and sugars. This is the ant's food. Both the ants and the cultivated fungus are dependent on each other for living. The ants need the fungus as a food. They're dependent on it. You take away the fungus. I'll cut that short if you want to see the whole clip. Uh, we're running out of time. But the point about this leaf cutter ant is that it grows mushrooms. That's what it lives on. It cuts down the leaves. It takes them underground. It chews them up or passes it on to another sort of ant which chews it up. It makes compost. And the queen ant sows the compost with fungus because when the queen ant goes off to make a new, new nest, she keeps a bit of fungus in her mouth because this fungus is only found on ants' nests and won't grow anywhere else. And she, she seeds it and they cultivate mushrooms and they eat the mushrooms. And this mushroom has got very particular humidity and temperature requirements to you know, a degree or so. And they keep the underground nests to that perfect temperature and humidity by opening and closing doors. And they do that without a leader. Now, I'm not saying that the secret of that isn't in the DNA somewhere, but who put it there? Scientists, that this goes on, the film goes on to say, well, they, they were surprised why it was that when you take an ant out of the, uh, the fungus that they eat, it overgrows with a, a deadly fungus that kills the whole thing. Why doesn't that happen when the ants are there? And then they noticed that on the ant's body it's covered in a white coat. And they studied the white coat and found that the white coat is a network of bacteria of the sort that produce antibiotics which stop the harmful funguses from overwhelming their food supply. Now, all of that has to come together, doesn't it? 
All of that has to come together. You can't have it bits at a time. Because it doesn't work. It, it is irreducibly complex. Doesn't that speak to us about a designer who is greater than the parts we're looking at? I think that's the argument that scripture uh, puts to us. Bristol University found something else. They, they found that some of these uh, wood ants, when they leave the nest, they're in a hurry. And if they find an obstacle, like a hole in the ground, an ant will come up to it, measure himself against the hole, and if he's big enough, he'll fit in the hole, and everybody runs over his back so they aren't slowed down. Yeah. Just by chance. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. That's what the world is called upon to believe. And what I think happens is in the David Attenborough program is that you see this and you go, oh, it's marvellous. Evolution's fantastic. It's wonderful. And because you told that's evolution. Well, it's fantastic. I'm convinced. It's it. It must be it. Look at that. I mean, that is so marvellous. That's, that's what's happened. There's a sleight of hand here. Um, now this... Uh, Thomas Nagel says this, what is the likelihood that self-reproducing life forms should have come into existence spontaneously? Right? What is the, the likelihood of uh, genetic mutations producing uh, the species? He said, that's what he's asking. Right? And he says, I realize that such doubts will strike many people as outrageous. That is because almost everyone in our secular culture has been browbeaten into regarding the reductive research program as sacrosanct on the grounds that anything else would not be science. That's what's going on. It's not that scientists disprove God. It's that they, scientists have adopted a philosophy which is contrary to the philosophy of the Creator. And so you find that they still speak about design but attribute it to the creature. This is the paradox. Darwin seems to have expelled design from biology and yet we still go on using the teleological language. So you'll see every BBC program talk like this, all right? Zebras evolved stripes in order to hide, you know. Lions evolved this in order to, in order to. You can't say that. It's not, there's no in order to in evolution. It's a, it's, it's a chance process and then a selection of that which is fittest. There was no in order to about it. But because you've attributed the in order to to the creature, people are convinced. Because they need an in order to. Because everything in the nature is telling us about things are in order to. And God is telling us through the Apostle Paul, it's speaking of the invisible things that we can put our faith in. The Word of God by which all things came to be.